So, my name is Chris Markle. I am a fourth year PhD candidate at the University of Iowa, and uh, I get three fancy letters after my name until I graduate. All, uh, ABD, which means all but dissertation. So, I've done all the classwork, and now it's just writing. Luckily, it's stuff I love. It's this stuff right here. So, I'm hoping to have a discussion with you today about attrition in high school choral music. Why do students drop out? So today we're gonna. Will this come here? Come to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. So we're gonna look at the scope of the presentation today. So first, we're gonna get a little glimpse into my personal background, both my education and my teaching. We're gonna talk about the importance of the topic, so we can see what they're talking about why it's important, how is it relevant to you. We're going to look at some previous research that I have conducted, both from the student and the teacher perspectives. We're going to look at the implications for where do we go from here, how can we take the next step, and then I hope to have a really good discussion. So we'll get rolling, and then the best thing I can offer you is going to be some information on some resources. Uh, there'll be a, uh, a QR code to scan if you're interested, or just like some up. Uh, other ways to get a hold of this information so you can share it with your, uh, your faculty, your staff, your students. So what is beyond the scope of today's presentation is unfortunately I cannot address all your specific concerns. We'll have a great discussion, but unfortunately everybody is so different with their school districts and their levels and their, their choir needs that I hope you come away with some great ideas, but it's probably not going to solve all your enrollment problems. Sorry. So a little bit about my background, I went to Northwest Missouri State University in Maryville, Missouri uh, for my undergraduate degree in music education way back in the day. Then I continued on and went straight through and got a degree in choral conducting uh, from the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And uh, after that I'm currently in my fourth year at Iowa, which again is ABD, so we can uh, have that <coughs> next, step, next step looming in the future, I hope. So in my personal teaching and research background uh, has been primarily in high school choral music. And I've taught high school choirs in three states, in Texas, in Wisconsin, and Iowa for 12 years. My first teaching assignment was in a school where it was a 50% uh, Hispanic population for the enrollment of the school. My second one was a rural school, which was 200 students, 7 through 12. Uh, and so that was a big change because the previous school had 1,500 students. And then most recently, I was at Dubuque Senior High School for seven years, and uh, they had an enrollment of 1,600, and uh, a, a fairly well-established choral program there. I've had the opportunity to present information on both my research and existing research on this topic on both the state, the national, and on the international level. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. So why this? Why am I passionate about it? Because when I was at Dubuque Senior High School, I, could, I never seemed to get the students in my program. We had an okay feeder program. They did a good job. It was a, a thriving program. They sang at the junior high level. And then when it came to the high school, I lost them. I lost them. And I didn't know why. And it was frustrating because I thought I did what I needed to do. I was visible. I took my choirs there. I invited them to the concerts. We had some steps in, in place. But... I never, I never lost. I, I never got them. And so it's difficult at a 4A school also because you're competing with so many different programs. And not just a 4A high school, pardon me, at any high school you're competing with different programs. So we're going to talk about some of those things along the way. But that's why I wanted to know more. So the importance of the topic, people are talking. And you might not be able to read all this. These are taken from the I'm a Choir Director Facebook group page. So really that is an actual post. I covered their name and face for anonymity reasons. So I'll read it to you also. On attrition and retention, today I received an email from a student saying that he is not taking choir next year because he feels it is not his forte. Also, he said he would like to explore other electives in preparation for college. I have other students who are not taking choir next year for academic concerns. They feel that the evening concert commitment you know, throughout the year take away too much time from studies. What are some things you say to your students considering quitting choir? Some of my freshmen also have told me they're taking a break in order to fulfill their personal finance graduation requirements. 
which is a state requirement in New Jersey in this particular case. Any device, etc. So with this post, there are another 50 comments about it. So it showed me that people are talking about it. Within the slide, is it hitting already? Some a couple people, yeah. Okay, and on the next one, I teach middle school, five to eight, and see recruitment and retention as a big part of our job as feeders into the high school program. What are some collaborations that you do between the high school, middle school program to strengthen the department as a whole? Middle school, elementary school collaborations also. There is no currently no elementary choir in my district. So fifth grade at that middle school is their first experience. Also, is there anything specific you do for retention between sixth and seventh grade? I see a bit of a drop, or at least a struggle. So it, it comes at that transition area between elementary school into middle school, and then again from middle school into high school, and then even at the high school into college, um, we want to keep students singing as lifelong learners. And then our last one, I have a student who came to me, this, oh, this one it breaks my heart because I lived it, this is, this is not me, but I've been here, who came to me this morning to tell me that her mother is removing her from chorus after this nine weeks, Student says her mom is removing her, or doesn't see the value, and thinks it's just a class where she sings and talks to her friends. Administrator says mom is using the removal as a punishment for the student not behaving at home, having tried everything else. Administrator will remove the, her despite my protests and the fact that they signed my handbook. What should I do? Admins say they will talk to mom one more time to see if they can suggest something else. We all know the value of choral singing and music education, but how do you fight for your program and singers when the parents and administration don't see it. And I continue to see nods, and that's fantastic. That means you're in the right place, and I, I'm hoping that you can help me with the conversation today. So what are our colleagues talking about? You've heard some of those, and for each one of those comments, there were, again, a list of several dozen comments, some with suggestions, some with um, sympathy and empathy, saying this same thing has happened to me. This is horrible. What do we do? So... The different areas that are possible that come up when talking about attrition are some of these nine areas. Recruitment, retention, we'll talk more about that later. Unsupportive administration, uninformed school counselors. Now, when I say uninformed, I don't mean uneducated. Okay, I just want to be clear that I'm pro-counselor. My mother-in-law is a counselor. So, pro-counselor. Feeder programs, and I call them feeder programs. That's kind of the vernacular, if there's a different word that you use for your transition program that builds into yours. Um, graduation requirements, elective options, starting choir early, both as a school district starting an elementary choir early, and also for the students to be involved in choir early, how that will benefit them. And in the United States, we primarily have AP courses, although some schools also have the International Baccalaureate Program, which is just as rigorous, if not more, of a program for our students. So my previous research, I've conducted two studies already uh, on participation in choral music and why students drop out in attrition. So one study is from the student perspective, and the other study is from the director perspective. And my goal is to kind of compare the two, to see who thinks what, and do they line up, and are the students really telling us why they're getting out, or are they giving us a reason that's not going to hurt our feelings? In the student perspective survey study that I did, it was a qualitative study, so forgive me as I quickly define, within a qualitative study, it is more about the narrative of the students rather than having a sample of hundreds or thousands. It's a few people that you take a time to really interview and get to know their, their story, and you're going for the richness of the data, and the data, in this case, are their words. So I, I really focus more on the student perspective when it comes to why they're dropping out, this is what I want to know. What we think is important too, but for, the, the, for this presentation today, it's mainly based on the student data that was collected. So I interviewed high school seniors at a uh, Midwest high school. And so there are benefits to that. One is maturation. They're older, they've, been to, they've lived it. Now that they're older and they look back, you know what, here's what I did. Maybe it was foolish, maybe it was a really good idea. Okay, the bad part about that is maturation. <laughs> it's the same thing. Because they, if they dropped out their sophomore year, it's not as current. The pain isn't as real anymore. They, things have passed. They've grown up. So it's both a positive and a negative. 
that I interview the high school seniors. I wanted to know what are the reasons why these students are dropping out. And sometimes I pointedly asked them what was the reason. So these students were chosen because they dropped out of choir at some point in high school. Um, for one student, it was their freshman year. For one student, it was the last semester of their senior year. So it runs the gamut of, of the length. And then what are the students really telling us? So first of all, all students should feel welcome. That's what they say. So these headings are the themes that the students presented to me. So I take all their quotes and their data and their, uh, their narratives and I kind of sorted through it and I came out with these general themes. And one was students should feel welcome. So with that, what are we doing to promote a healthy learning environment for our students? Envision your classroom, your rehearsal space, whatever you have. So when students are walking in, what do they see? And what do you think they see? And are they the same? So are they walking into a, a safe and healthy space? Uh, is there, do they feel included and valued? For students of the LGBTQ community, have you gone so far as to promote a safe place mentality and philosophy in your classroom? All those things may be important. How do you prevent cliques in your classroom? We have experienced them as performers and singers, a lot of us in high school, and we've been bullied and teased, and different, there are different cliques, and it's the, the, the term is culturally relevant to be cool, right? That's the term now to make it sure that it's culturally relevant. But what happens when the clique is your choir? What happens when you've got seven choirs or five vocal jazz groups and the top vocal jazz group is the one who's looking down and teasing the first group because they're just not, well, they're not good enough. And then how do you address bullying in your class? Is it something that, all right guys, cut it out, come on, you, you know better than that. Or is it something where you nip it in the bud and it is, that is not accepted and you talk about it so that your students visibly see you having those conversations? So some of the conversation I'm going to put back to you as far as what you actually do and what you perceive. And so some of these are rhetorical. I don't expect a, a conversation for every question, but these nonetheless are questions I think we can think about. So these next few slides are going to be quotes from students after asking some of these questions on why they dropped out of choir. I'll let you read for a second, but then I'll read it too. I think it's important to let people know that everyone is welcome in choir and that they are not only welcome, but wanted <coughs> and valued. That's my word, I'm gonna toss it in there too, valued. I think that it's important to establish that. Choir is supposed to be something fun, not necessarily just for, like, the music-y people. Right? So we have to think about what's the perception, not only in our choir, in our program already, what is the school perception of our choir? How do we get out to those students? And that talks about recruitment. Right? So we all need an audience. So we don't expect every student to enroll in our choirs. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we are presenting a really good and healthy image of our programs to the rest of the school and the staff and the community too, not just our school. So again, 18 year old high school senior. The music department is very much its own group. They are definitely the choir kids. If someone wanted to join choir, they might feel like they weren't welcome because they're not one of the choir kids that have been doing choir for such a long time and have been involved with after-school musicals and music lessons. So, a slide will address this in a moment, but think about those students who are always in your room that you see for four hours a day, and then think about the students that come and sing and leave. What's the perception? So when I ask the question, what would you want other choir directors to know? That's y'all. I think that it's really important to let their students know that they are welcome there, wanted, again, in your choir department, and that, like, let them feel wanted. Okay, so it's more than just, like, 
hey, I'm glad you're here. We have to take the time to, and go out of our way to make them know that they're welcome and wanted and valued. Student feedback. What are we doing? Students don't feel like they're being heard. <coughs> so what can, what is the option? What are fixes for that? Sometimes it's easy. What about a quick Google, Google form at the end of a week? Project on your board. Send a link through Canvas, through Moodle, through whatever classroom management system you have. And it can be as simple as, this week, did you feel valued in my classroom? And sometimes just taking that moment to ask will catch a student off guard. Like I've never had a student ask, or a teacher ask, have I felt valued in their classroom? I just thought I was there to learn. Right? But for so many of our students, we see them for four years, and then we see their sister or their brother for four years. and we, So their families are with you for a long time. Think about the repertoire that you choose. And who chooses Do you choose it? Is it a student base? Do you have opportunities for a student to choose the literature? And the level, is it too hard? Are you programming so that the students have that level that's just out of their reach? Right? And that, I think that's healthy. I think that's good. We need to program the, some literature that will challenge all of our students, not just the, the advanced kids, not just the lower end, the, the um, students with um, less skill. Uh, we have to make sure that everybody's being challenged. And then are there those pieces that are attainable for everybody, that the whole choir can get and grasp and enjoy and feel success and feel value? Look what I did today. I did this. Choir events. Do our students like them? Between uh, Dubuque Senior High School has, has a magical ensemble. And uh, it's been around for a long, as 41 years, as long as I've been alive. 41 years. And as part of this, we go out for the Christmas season. And between Thanksgiving and Christmas, there are, we had 15 performances. Not all during the school day, because I'm not crazy. But about five of them were. About five of them. And so that means, and it's usually over the lunch hour, right? It's like the Rotary Club or the whatever. And it's nice and important. But if a student has math class every day, and depending on your schedule, it's, it may be block, it may be the traditional seven hour period, eight hour period. It's the same class every, now my students always knew that if they need to, they can, they need to be in school for their academic grades, and this is that fun extra thing that we do sometimes. But uh, luckily we had enough people that it was successful either way. But academics always came first, as it should, right? But are there too many? And if you have a vocal jazz group, and a madrigal, and a show choir, and a this, and a, then it becomes crazy with all the weekends that you spend. And is it fun? And where is the line? And who's the student that's like, oh my god, enough already. I just want to have a weekend with my family. I would have liked it if the choir department took a little more, a, a, a little bit more student suggestion. I get that they are professional music, music teachers, and they really know a lot about music. I think it is always important with whatever you're teaching to know that your students are enjoying what they're doing and getting a lot out of it. I think maybe a little more student feedback would help. Okay, and so this was from a student who was not the greatest singer and her sister sang and her mom sang and so she felt like she really should keep up the family tradition and because mom and mom wants me to and my sister really wants me to and I'll be in the same group as my sister. But she knew for a fact that she was not going to be a music educator, she's not going to be a performer, she just wanted to have fun. And when she got there she realized, wow, there are some people who are, this is their life, they are here all the time. And she just did not feel welcome. And there was no outlet for that. And as a freshman she felt intimidated to approach the director, as who was a male, so there's a power differential happening there also. And say, I don't feel comfortable, or I'm not having a good time. And the director never asked, so she dropped out. I hated the song for a second. They were boring compared to the ones we had sang in previous years. The director made us sing them for the sake of being difficult. It felt like it said. It was a lot of weird dissonances that sounded kind of cool, but just wasn't fun to sing.
this is from a school that had some regional performances and were well regarded for their choral sound and their, their pieces were very good but also a bit avant-garde sometimes and so I think we have to be careful with how we program especially if you're a large choir, a large ensemble, even band instrumental in the area and you can do songs like that doesn't mean you necessarily should do pieces like that where it's all just work, 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 work all the time and there's no fun. So reach out and connect with our students. Another way of saying this and phrasing this is teacher relationships. What relationships do you have with your students? We talked earlier about the students who don't engage themselves. They come, they sing, they're nice and polite, and they do their part, and they sing well enough, and then they leave, and I don't really know what this student does in her spare time because I, <coughs> she's just one of my 400 students that I have. I didn't have 400. Okay, one of my many students that I have. So I, I can't really keep up with all of them. I mean, surely. Or can you? Right? How can you find and take the time to connect to each student? Are we in the hallways between classes? I know that's encouraged by a lot of administration. At the same time, um, I've got like three choirs back to back. I don't have a lunch break. I have lessons after that. Um, I don't have a time to actually sit and plan. So these are five minutes. This is like gold for me. So, but how can we counter that and do something productive with our time that affects our students and the morale of our program. And then do we show favoritism? I did. Did it. For the students who are always in our classroom, they come in the morning to jazz choir rehearsal and then they stay, they have class during the day and then they're in your classroom for lunch. Oh, and then they have band, so they're in the music program again for that, so they're the band students. And then after school they're in um, all state rehearsal and after that They've got a jazz band rehearsal or something. And then they've got um, musical after that. So I literally four to six hours a day, I'm with the same students. And then they're also the ones who do honor choirs on the weekend. So I'm with them on a social level also. So it's not just the academic settings. It's those same students who make the same honor choir year after year that you take out of, um, out of your program. And then again, who is watching? It's that student who isn't as engaged. Those are the students that are maybe watching you sh show favoritism when we don't think we are. We just think we're doing our job. right? I thought I was just doing my job. They're just a really talented student, so I want to make sure they have all the options. Well, am I making sure that all students have the options to compete or to put themselves out there or to find a safe place for them to do a, like a, a non-audition honor choir that's just you know regional, that y'all come bring your, your people, so what do I do? What relationships do I have? So the director asked the choir what songs we wanted to sing. We all voted for songs that he didn't want to do. The director still chose the songs that he wanted to do. And the entire choir kind of didn't get along with him well my entire senior year. So the director did a good job by asking, what do you want to do? And then didn't do what they said or they suggested, and then there was this that happened because of it. So, and of course, I'm not going to let students pick every single song for my concert series. That's not going to happen, right? But even part of the core art standards is the student process of selecting literature, appropriate literature for age and skill level. And so we have to make sure that we're giving them opportunities and teaching them how and setting guidelines for them to select music. Maybe. The seniors are selecting your graduation song. What song out of the last four years have you loved seniors that you want to do? You can vote and come together, and this will be a great way to demonstrate a song you're passionate about when you're here in my program. Versus, uh, we're going to do a complete set of Eric Whitaker pieces for the. Uh, they're pretty, but oh my god, the awkward dissonances and the. Um, we're going to do. We're going to feature um, a set of four um, French chansons on this concert series. <laughs> <laughs> and they all have their places, right? But at the same time, toss in, toss in something new out there, right? They're called Pops Concert for a reason. Pop is in popular, right? With a school as old as Dubuque Senior High School, and there's music, there's literally 2,000 titles 
in my library that were used, a lot of them for Pops concerts back in 1957 or something. And let me tell you, those are not as popular anymore for some reason. If you don't catch it early, what happens? If you don't make that connection with them their freshman year, what about before they even come to you? How do they demonstrate their dislike or disagreement with you? Well, I'm just not going to sing if he's not going to listen to me. Then we get to scheduling. Scheduling is a very big part of why students drop out. Now, there are many aspects of scheduling. This is a few. There are many more that your school is going to have that I don't have accounted for. I'm hoping those are things we can talk about in a few minutes. So elective options. I know that was always difficult for me uh, when our district went to the 4x4, four the four, four years of science and math. And that took a great, a, a big hit for our electives. Um, wellness was a thing that was very challenging. PE. The kids had to take a wellness class and a lot of them were saving it until their senior year. They kept pushing it back because they wanted to be in choir, but eventually they had to take it. Now, luckily, Dubuque had a system where you could do, like, uh, you could go work out at the YWCA and get credit for your time, and that was fantastic. And some schools have, uh, have even gone to the, uh, where it's like marching band is a credit, maybe even show choir is a wellness <coughs> credit. And if your school is one of them, then Love ya. <laughs> I'm, I'm so jealous. AP courses. I had many, many, many students taking five, six AP credits. I've had students audit choir because they were going to be the salutatorian or valedictorian of their class, and choir wasn't a weighted class for grade, and so they either dropped out or they had to audit my class and just said, which, oh, thank you for, for doing that. I mean, they didn't have to. And so hopefully that shows that I was reaching out to those students and making a good relationship then. A lot of AP courses were opposite of classes. And if they were really advanced, under, I did a good job of scheduling the upper level students away from the AP courses. But if they were an advanced freshman or sophomore, they could take those classes. And uh, I had a lot of students really just beg me, can you please move our trouble choir time? I was like, ah, I can't do that because there's so many that, so what, and you have to lose a couple. So graduation requirements, we talked briefly about that. Uh, family conflicts and work conflicts, sometimes they're the same. So sometimes those students are needed to work in the community to help pay for their family's bills for the month. And we often overlook our privilege sometimes and realize that we always know where our next meal, next meal is coming from, but some families don't. And so they really can't be in a musical because I'm, they're working full time in addition to trying to be a student. Multiple ensembles. Some programs are great about it. They can be in band or orchestra at the same time. Um, some, some choir programs anymore have, well, you have to be a member of this ensemble to be a member of, of that ensemble. Well, that's just more time in class periods, right? And then school counselor awareness of your program. So with this, again, it's not an uneducated issue. It's just an uninformed issue. And so this is in regards to the, the counselors at maybe your feeder program school or the school underneath you, perhaps the 7th and 8th grade middle school. And when it comes time for registration, those counselors register those students, but they don't always know how your program is organized. They don't know that you will fight for them to be in your program, and you can rearrange things. And if they can't be inquired now, but you can be inquired later or vice versa, Maybe they can't be inquired now, but they can later, that we want, that we're going to go get them. But we need to know that. So, we took good care of our counselors. Come fruit sale times, here's your basket of fruit counselors. There you go. We love you, thanks. All the students that they don't have a place for, I want them. If they ever sang ever, get them through the door. That's the hard part, right? Through the door. So, counselor awareness of the program. graduation requirements, A push being AP US history or AP psych. And this was a, a nursing student.
was going through the CNA program, attending, her schedule was nuts. Oh my, mornings were like the college course, and then she came back, and then did the, the mentoring program for the middle school, and then after school, she did gymnastics, and it, like, I like busy, but this was, this was nuts. So it's no, no doubt that we lose some of these students. So the second study was a perspective from the teachers on why we thought students were dropping out. So I mentioned most of my quotes come from the student perspective because I think that's really more important. So in this section, you're going to see a lot of questions proposed back to you. Some are rhetorical, some I want to know about. How are we doing over here? Uh-oh. Oh, no, we closed. Pause. Technical difficulty, Wally. Reestablish. Glad I checked. This is a great site, ruin, by the way. Until it crashes on you. Holes. I used a lot recently. So again, as a qualitative study, I interviewed teachers, five teachers, high school directors. But I recently made contacts with students, uh, teachers from different countries at a conference I went to. And I wanted to see how their perspectives changed. And so those teachers were in Kuwait, Switzerland, and South Korea. Some very interesting stories. Two directors of the United States, one was public, one was parochial, because I wanted a different view. So their view was retention. How are we actively addressing retention? Are we, are we seeking out a roster for those few programs? Hey, I know that you just sent me, I, when I attended your, your middle school, you had 40, 50 kids in eighth grade choir. Um, I only got like five of them. Can I get a roster of your list so I can go back and double check and make sure who got in? So if your students don't persist from year to year, do you seek them out? hey, I saw that you didn't register for whatever choir. Sometimes the counselors make you double check with your teachers, like you gotta get a permission from, great. My, mine didn't, so I just got ghosted <laughs> with the choir students. And who keeps the kids going? Is it our responsibility as the high school group to go back and get the, to the feeder programs and be there, or are we expecting our feeder programs to light that fire and instill a passion? What about elementary school? Do we look to them to start a choir so that not just general music, an actual choir choir, so that they see that they're passionate about singing and not just orphan instrument, which is very good too, of course. But. And the concept of recruiting. What do you think is more important, recruiting or retention? It's like the chicken and the egg, right? And for every program, it's different. You may have so many students that, well, I don't really need to recruit anymore. Whew. I'll try to subdue my eye roll. Okay. Or is it retention? I just, I'm, I just want to keep the kids I've got. Look, it's a hard enough. I, don't, I know there's a lot more out there that I don't get, but I just need to keep my babies. These are, I, I want to keep them here. Okay, so what do you do? Do you have a donut day with your, with your groups? I stole this one from that guy over there. Okay. Donut day, do you have bring a friend to choir day? I had a get list where I put everybody's name who's not in choir that my students recommended on a big poster. And as students got, came to me with, the, with that student, hi, Mr. Marple, this is Bob. Hi, Bob. The student in choir got extra credit. <laughs> okay? When I walked the hallway, I had a caught you card. Like, I caught you singing. And so if they were singing and not in choir, I made a big deal of it. Hey, that was fantastic. I have this card. This card is good for one free voice lesson. Well, of course, they're free. I'm the choir guy. <laughs> but it's one free, and they felt like, wow, wow, okay, maybe I will come see you. And then if they're in the door, they're in the door. That's the hard part. And visibility. What can we do to, steep, uh, to keep uh, visible? Talk with the jocks. My best experience was when I had the varsity quarterback in choir. Boy, I had, the, I had the guys, let me tell you. But then he graduated, and I lost the guys. So do you need to, can you go to those rehearsals after school of practices, after school? Right? And say, hey, you know what? 
I could really use your leadership. I know in athletics and sports, you train, you talk a lot about leadership and team and togetherness, and I could sure use that in my choral program. Is there any way that you could come in so you make them feel like the most important things ever? Family support. Some don't see the importance. There's a family in Kuwait, and in Kuwait, there are a lot of literal, literal royalty. And they were on a tour, and they had to stay in a hotel. And so this royal person, dad, told the choir director, no, 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 my family does not stay in a hotel that is beneath us. That is for common people. And so we'll be taking her out of the choir. That's my, that's my top story. I can't top that here, and that's not going to happen here. So, of the countries that didn't see as much of a future in choral music at that level was South Korea. Because they said they're going to send their students to do something that mattered. Most of them go to like oh, semi students to school in the United States. So they don't have time for choir. There's no future in it. The, the, uh, the country that focused most on dual enrollment, the importance of getting that college credit now, where do you think? U.S. public, show me the money. So if they can take five EP courses and six and take the, and get the college credit ahead of time, then we're going to do it. I'm sorry, there's no time for choir because you're not going to get paid to sing in choir. Right? That's a lie. We know that's a lie. So sometimes those scholarships for music are just as competitive and available as academic scholarships. And the country that did not have parents attend the concerts was South Korea because they, they, they were needed at home because they have families and kids, and there's no future, so I'm not going to, it's fine. She'll sing and do her thing, right? So peer involvement, we've got to keep the boys a bit, but don't forget the girls. When we spend a lot of time positively praising the guys, I'm so glad you're here, this is great, we've got 13 whole guys and 87 girls, this is fantastic. <laughs> it's great. Guys, guys, i got, I got this great song program for you, it's this great upbeat piece, and, the, and then the girls have this lovely little ballad, this lullaby, it's pretty and it's nice, and, and so a lot of times the girls are the ones who are overlooked because we spend time on the guys. So you have to find that balance. And so let me get into the societal challenges of masculinity and gender normativity and stereotypic stereotypes of what a guy should be. Well, singing is for girls. But oftentimes the guys want to sing with their buddies. They had a good time in middle school or elementary and they want to get back to that and they want to sing with their buddies. Along those same lines are cultural similarities. So not only are they buddies, they want to sing with someone who looks like me. There's someone, there's another Pacific Islander girl in choir. There's another Somali boy in choir. There's another black boy in choir. And each of those cultures have has a complete different world, a macrocosm of what's considered masculine. So that's, that's very challenging. You have to consider it's not just getting the boys, it's what's behind the boys. It's what's behind the families. And then convincing high school freshmen that you don't have to travel in this pack. Well, Jessica's quitting choir because she broke up with her boyfriend, so I'm not going to, I'm going to support my friend and they all leave. Well, no. It's okay. You will make other friends and reach out, and you will be welcomed, hopefully, and valued and loved. Thoughts on scheduling. The AP and IB International Baccalaureate course we talked briefly about. So this was another thing that the teachers thought, well, this is the reason why. It's scheduling. I see a lot of nodding heads out there, so I think we can all kind of agree that plays a part. Sports, all the extras. All the extras are kind of in one category. Sports, extracurricular, work, family, the non-academic things. We talked briefly again about the school awareness of the program. Do you go to your counselor and say, here's a list of my choirs. Here's how they all make them. Here's what happens from, the, from my theater program. And walk them through the process. I don't know. I, I didn't for a while. And sometimes they just have a changing interest, and that's okay. And we have to be able to support our students and be like, you know what, we want you to have the best experience possible and the most well-rounded education possible. So go experience AP photo or whatever they have, journalism. So in the comparison between the two studies, 
The students listed these as their top reasons, the themes why they did not persist in singing. Scheduling, student feedback, too clicky, cultural relevance, right? And the teacher relationship. Teachers said scheduling, feeder programs, family issues, family support, family background, that my mom played, my mom sang, my dad did this, I sing at home, peers. But take a look between the two lists. There are, there's at least one definite similarity. But overall, the teachers chose the more external reasons why. It was them. It's something they did. It's not me. It's not my relationship with the student. Surely I have a great, I have this poster outside my door. It says, safe place, all are welcome. Surely it's not me. Right? But that's what they think versus what they're being told and why they're really dropping out, why the students are really dropping out. So what can we do? It's, I think it's visibility. It's such a big part of it. We've got to take ourselves, go teach a, a voice lesson, go direct a choir at the middle school level, go assist at a musical rehearsal for the middle school. Invite your feeder program students to your concerts. Take six boys with you and go to the middle school and sit in on a rehearsal. Connect to our students in whatever way that means for you. It's all going to be different. So what can you do that one action step forward? What's that one step you can take that's different? Go talk to those counselors. Hey, I just want to make sure, I know registration is coming up in February. Do you understand, do you, do you, can I give you a, some documentation about how our program is run? Start a parent choir. Oh my God, would that be amazing? Featuring the parents. Show them what happens in your program. Have a sight reading example. It happens here. It's going to happen in all state this year. All state choir sight reading. So sight singing on your concerts. Do a five minute sample of you know what? Here's what, here's behind the curtain. Here's how we do do our sight reading excerpts every day. What's next for me? Dissertation time as my as my advisory system back then. You're not going. <laughs> so the next step is I'm hoping to take this research and uh, fine tune it into one small area. And so the working title right now is, is The Persistence of Adolescence in Choral Singing During the Transition Between Middle and High School. And I think that's, that's what I want to know. And so we're going to survey a bunch of 8th grade students, ask them for about 40 questions. Why, did you, well, why, why do you plan on persisting? Why don't you? And then ask them all these reasons. And to what level of strength? And then... The high school director in that district is going to take the same survey. My students feel that they are welcome, or do I feel welcome? And so I hope to investigate the similarities between those answers. That's what I want to take the next step. And so hopefully at the end of the summer and into the fall, that will be available for the world to, to have. So uh, that um, is my time. I want to look at some of our discussion topics and see what I can do to at least talk about it here. Is there anything I can do about having about students having to leave choir because of scheduling issues? What do you think? This is where I get to turn it over. What can be done about a student who's had to leave for scheduling issues? What has been done? What have you tried? <coughs> yes, sir. Well, one of the things that I do is I have um, I have uh, some of my upper uh, tenors and bases uh, leave because of scheduling. And so in the morning, um, I'm the donut choir guy, <laughs> by the way. Um, so one of the things that I've done with, with my donut choir is some of those guys can sing and they join us uh, in the mornings. Um, but then what I've had them do is sometimes I will take them and do a, uh, a, a sectional with them. And I have them sing with my upper group later on to help add those numbers in. So there's still kind of a part of it, it's just they can't be there at the class because they have AP Lit, or AP, 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 AP. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of, the, what's, one of the ways that I get them to be involved in those different aspects. Okay. Anyone else have a trick? <coughs> yes, I've please. kind of done the same thing. I've done some, oh, very rarely, but some independent choir. They have to mm -hmm. come in every week and learn the music. Yeah. But, and then they just sing on the contest. They can't sing in contest stuff, yeah. because that's not eligible. But they can still sing 
done our normal concerts. And right. for some kids that works, some kids say they're going to do it and then they never show. Yeah. And I don't, I haven't gone and hunted them down. Perhaps I should have. Um, but for some kids who just need a semester to take something that works mm -hmm. for them. Great idea. Independent study. And sometimes you got to convince your, your administration, like, this can work. This will be challenging, but you can do it. And here's how. Okay. And then online cl college classes are more important. Some consider. But how do you get past choir isn't cool? That was so hard. And it's still challenging. And it's, I try to get my students to sing everywhere. At pep rallies, at um, homecoming, before, before school, after school, in the, in the cafeteria sometimes. Hey, hey, jazz choir, we're going to go test out this piece. And it just became a visibility issue. And one student see other students in choir that they have and they know and they're in sports with. And they're, wow, maybe, I, maybe that's not dork thing like I thought it was. Maybe that's a, it took a while and it will take a while to convince that flow. So I know our time is, is up. I'll keep going for just another minute or so. Uh, but here's what I can do. If you're interested, uh, if you want to actually text your email address, I'll make sure that you get a copy of this and these topics to have conti uh, continued conversation. And then I'll make sure that you get a, uh, a copy of this actual slide presentation also. So uh, I, I mentioned that I would provide a QR thing for you if you're one of those QR <coughs> that way. So if you're a QR person, I'll take just a second so you can take a quick pick of that. And that will take you to my website where you can find these resources. And they're resources from uh, different choir blogs, music education blogs on the inter internet about how to retain students and how to keep them and how to recruit students. And then you'll also find a list of my references that I use for a lot of my, my studies for my research. And while some of those are taken from um, academic journals, from scholarly journals, from practitioner journals, choral journal, there's a lot of really helpful things that maybe you can find that one article that might pertain to your program. So as we go forward, I just want to make sure that you take away the importance of making sure that your students are feeling valued and welcome into your programs. Everyone's going to have a different way to do that. And if you're doing it already, then that's fantastic. That's what our students need. But think about that one action step. What can you do that's that one extra thing to show that you really care about your students? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in this room and you wouldn't be in our profession. So again, thank you for your time and I hope you have a great day.